I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 2. Let's, uh, let's take a look at this text, although we're good Lutherans and we all know this one by heart, right? For by grace you are saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God. But hey, let's still look at it because uh, the beauty of that gift is kind of like what we said in the children's lesson. How do you measure the love of God? And, and sometimes after a while, I think we just kind of take it for granted. It's just there. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And of course he loves me because I'm a good Lutheran, right? You know, and I worship him and I, and I praise him and all of that. Uh, but boy, what a what great songs, Paul. Thank you for, for taking us down that road and all those, all those songs and letting the uh, people before us really lead us into that word. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, 12, 1242. You'll find it in your pew Bible there. Um, have you ever thought this? It ought to be the easiest thing in the world for us to evangelize. It ought to be the easiest thing in the world to talk to people about Jesus Christ. Because you and I know that without Christ, we are truly dead. And Paul even says it stronger because he uses the word corpse. He says, we are a corpse in our trespasses and sin. So you'd think that if people knew that they were dead and they were dying and, and they were going to end up going to hell, that they would want to hear the greatest news of all. And that is that somehow God figured out a way for his only son to become a corpse for us. Can we say that? He was dead three days in the tomb, become a corpse for us. And then he rose from the dead and now you've got eternal life. Wouldn't you think that people would be rushing to hear that word? But who's the last person you evangelized to? And who's the last person you told about Jesus Christ? It, it ought to be something we do, but, but yet we just don't grasp that. And maybe we don't so much as Christians too. Ian's got a birthday on Monday. He'll be mad that I mentioned that in the sermon. But he's going to be 16 on Monday, so watch out on the road. <laughs> Mom and dad are going to take him. He's going to get his license, and he's going to be on the road. He can't see me right now. Dennis, he's right behind you. So there we go. Hi, Ian. Good morning. Um, but, but we say he's 16 years old, but actually, if we're really honest with ourselves, the day he was born, you know, 16 years from tomorrow, he started in this process of dying, right? Because the clock started ticking to the day when Ian would die. We don't think about that. Um, we think about that after we die. You know, on the tombstone, it says, you know, for me, 1958, and then whatever year that is, that I'm going to die. But actually, that's really true, right? Because every single child that's born is going to die. It shakes us up, it rocks our world when it happens when they're very, very young. It, it seems a little more natural, but that's our word when they're older. But yet every single one of us, the minute we're born, the clock is ticking till the time we're going to die. Why? Not according to God's plan, right? We know from Genesis when God created the world, put Adam and Eve in that garden, gave them that tree of life that they might live forever. And that's the way that they were supposed to go. God was going to form and formed Adam and Eve out of the dust of the ground. He made them, he breathed life into them, and that life was going to last for eternity, except by their choice, by our choice, we choose to bring death into the world. Hence, Paul says, and you, verse one of our text, and you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. Trespasses is another word for the fall. It means literally that we've fallen from the level that we were at with God. Adam and Eve knew that because in the garden when they sinned, what did they do? They immediately hid. They covered themselves up. They, they knew something was wrong. They knew they had fallen from a place that God had put them in and where God wanted them to be for eternity. And they had fallen from that. But here's the good news, right? If I were God, I would have said, you made your bed, now go lie in it. But what does God do? Right after they fall, God is in the garden. He is looking for them. He is seeking them out. And like a mother who catches us with our hand in the cookie jar and says, no, what are you doing? <laughs> he knew exactly what they were doing, but he would not leave them and us alone, but immediately tell us about his plan to send a savior. But it's not just the fall that we deal with. Sorry, kids, we as parents give to you the only nature that we have, and that's a fallen nature. So guess what two sinners have when they have a child? Another sinner, and we keep passing this sin on throughout the generations. But it isn't just this fallenness. Paul says trespasses, so our fallenness, and our sins, those things we do every single day. Those things that we do, remember the three? In thought, in word, and in deed. Our heads, our mouths, and our hands get us in trouble all the time. And we miss the mark. It's literally what that word means. We know the mark that we're supposed to do. And it literally means we miss doing, we miss being driven by who we ought to be driven by. 
Now we know that we ought to be driven by God because God has given us much direction and, and, and he tells us about what our lives should be like. But unfortunately, too many times I'm driven by me, by the I, by my sinful self. And so because of that, Paul shows us this reality. It's like he puts a mirror in front of us and says, you guys are dead. You are corpses. So I had people say last night, turn to each other and say, not bad for a corpse, right? <laughs> this corpse made it to church today, but we made it here because, well, it's going to come a little bit later in the text. We have been made alive in Christ Jesus. And alive is truly what we are. But let's look at that struggle in our lives. Go on to verse 2. Paul says, and you are dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, right? Life is always described in, Bible as, in the Bible as a walk. Because we talk about our life as, as on a road. We're on a journey, right? And, and there's two roads that we can be on, right? <laughs> there's one that's wide and there's one that's narrow. And you and I, by the grace of God, by faith, by the work of the Holy Spirit, have chosen that narrow road. And it indeed is narrow, but it's a road that has some boundaries to it. It's a road that has some curbs on it to protect us and keep us because there's danger outside. But we walk in that and we walk in that every single day. What's it look like? Keep going in verse two. Uh, in which we once lived following the course of the world. See kids, we're right when we say to you, it's not good to say the reason why I'm doing this is because Everybody else is doing it, right? Even the Bible says that's not a good way to go. If everybody else is doing it, it probably means it's something that we shouldn't be doing. It probably means it's exactly the wrong way to go. Because the course of the world doesn't look at things the way we do. Following the prince of the power of the air, Paul says. <laughs> and the air in the sense of, well, you know that Chicago is not the windy city because of the, of the meteorological winds that happen, the stuff that Tom Skilling talks about. But it's because of our windy talk, right? All the hot air of our politicians and, and people promising something and, and then not carrying it out and, and saying they're going to do something and then do exactly the opposite. That's the kind of thing we're talking about. And the power of the prince of the air is Satan, whose very first words and all of his words ever since then are lies. Did God really say? He says to Adam and Eve, you will surely not die, he says to them. And Satan is always lying. Change these stones into bread because you can do it, he says to Jesus. And Satan, when he's talking, is always lying to us. He's full of hot air and we need to recognize him. But not only that, keep going. The spirit that is now in the work of the sons of disobedience. And what's it look like? Go on to verse 3. Among whom we once lived in the what? In the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of our body and our mind. You see, the desires of our body and our mind don't take us to good places. For instance, if every time I feel hungry, I eat something. Are you with me? It's probably not going to be good, right? If every time I feel hungry, if I see something that makes me hungry and I eat, it's not going to be good. I can't always trust that. How about what you think about? Have your thoughts always been good? Have your thoughts always led to good things? Do the things that come up in your mind are the things that you should carry out in your life? Well, I don't think I need to say much more, right? There's been many times when we've had to say to our mind, no, we're not going to do that. No, we're not going to go that way. We need to retrain our mind. We need to bring it back because we are by nature children of wrath, Paul says. And it's not just God's wrath because that's bad enough. Because when you go against God's word and against his way, we incur his wrath. You heard the Old Testament lesson when the people grumbled against God. But it's also wrath that happens here. When my former brother-in-law, Joe, told me that he was going to divorce my sister, I was mad at him. And so you see, sin brings on wrath from even each other. 
And when we do what we want in our hearts, and when we do what we want, what our head tells us to do, oftentimes it leads to that wrath. It splits up relationships that God wants to be a blessing to us. It hurts other people, and therefore this anger comes about. Do you ever notice how angry we are, even just as a society? That's kind of the way we react to everything. Where does that come from? Following Satan. Being that we are corpses, that we are dead in our trespasses and sin, and that death just keeps happening. And it's spread to everyone. That's why I said evangelism ought to be the easiest thing in the world, because the world is dying, and you and I have the message that gives them life. Because look at verse 4. There's a comma after all that Paul says. Well, there isn't literally in the text, but there is. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. And he could have launched into John 3.16, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him will not perish. There's that corpse thing. There's that dead thing. But have everlasting life. You see, God didn't leave it there. And God made a way because he loves us so much. So how would you answer that question? How do you measure the love of God? How how do you measure just how much God loves you? How do you measure the mercy of God for you? And how would you do that? Or what's the greatest gift you've ever received? What's what's the, the best thing you've ever gotten in your life? And know that having the love of God for us is a greater gift than anything you have ever received in your life or ever will receive in your life. It is truly the greatest gift. And that's the best part about it is that it's truly a gift. It's not something you can do anything for. It's not something you have to pay for. You don't have to earn it. And in a way, you don't have to worry about ever losing it because it's his gift. And it's his gift to you and me. Well, I can reject it. That's not believing. But if I'm in faith in Christ Jesus, I never once have to worry that somehow the love and the grace of God have run out on me. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, right? Shall trouble or hardship or famine or nakedness or sword go Romans 8. And it's all right there. And what did he do? Well, he raised us up. I'm in verse 6. He raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. See, there's this wonderful four-letter word when it comes to us and to God. And it's that word, with. We are with Christ. We are with him. We are seated with him. We die with him. We rise with him. Whatever happens to Jesus happens to us. Not the same level. But Jesus is born and Jesus dies, and Jesus rises. You and I are born, we die, and we rise. We are with him. It's an incredible word, isn't it? Christmas is all about Emmanuel, which means God is with us. We have a with us kind of God. And Paul says we are even right now seated with Christ in the heavenly places. What's that mean? Well, picture this. Picture the football coach on the sideline, and nowadays every single football coach has what on his head? His headset. And who's he talking to in his headset but the guys up in the press box? Why is he doing that? Because down on ground level, there's only so much that he can see. There's only, he's kind of blocked by the, by the big football players, but that guy up there has a bird's eye view. And Paul says, you and I live life with a headset on. Picture this. Not really, but picture it. In that we see everything that happens in this life, both from this perspective, but also from a heavenly perspective. Whatever we do for the least of these, my brothers, we're doing it for Jesus. We see that. We see that even in the little things that we do, powerful things are happening. We see that though there are troubles in this world, Paul says, I know that anything that happens to us in this world cannot be compared to the glory that's going to be revealed to us in heaven. We see on this plane the, the, the horror and the, and the bad things that happen in life, but yet we have a heavenly perspective that says, but God is still in charge. And we know how things have gone from the beginning of time, and we know how the story is going to end. We have a heavenly perspective when it comes to life. Keep that headset on.
right? And keep listening to the voice of God speaking to you. And what does that lead into? Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it's a gift from God, not a result of works so that no one can boast. Here we are, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And so what do we do? We walk in those good works. And some of you walk in those good works by taking care of loved ones. Some of us walk in those works by, by helping out at the food pantry. Some of us walk in those works by going to St. Matthew. Some of us walk in those works by the, by the way we treat our friends and the way we treat our family. We walk in those works in the way we, we, we live out our life as husband and wife and as, and as uh, children and, and aunts and uncles and all those things that God calls us to. And every single one of them we do knowing that our life isn't winding down, but that we are alive in Christ always, every single day, living. And there will never be a time when we're not alive in Christ for eternity. So live, not corpses, not dead people, but people who are alive. In a moment, your living Savior is going to be with you again in the closest way he will be here on this earth. His body, his blood for you. I know we do it every Sunday now, but let's never take for granted that incredible gift that he gives to us there. That we're assured again that we're forgiven. That we're empowered to be his people. That we are alive because we are fed by Christ every single day and living Living, let's be his workmanship every single day. In Jesus, amen.